I do have a couple of disclosures um, to make. I am the lead investigator for the Sydney Two Chair Trial, which is a trial of the use of ECMO support for in-hospital and out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Um, and uh, I'd like to acknowledge the support of, of Striker, who provide us with the Lucas devices for this trial, and Gatinki, who provide us with the ECMO equipment. Now, the basic idea behind ECMO for refractory cardiac arrest is very, really very simple. You have a patient that's in cardiac arrest, you bang in a big catheter into the femoral vein, suck blood out of the inferior vena cava with a centrifugal pump, pump that blood through an oxygenator, and pump it back up, usually up the other side, into the femoral artery. So it's a very simple circuit. Then you treat the underlying cause of the cardiac arrest, and hopefully you've corrected that. Wait for, little, for a few days until the heart re recovers, and then send the patient home. But there are a few caveats to all that. It sounds very simple in, in, in theory. First thing to point out is this is really only for a fairly limited number of cardiac arrest cases. Uh, this is a big trial, a uh, big study from Canada looking at out of hospital cardiac arrest, over 11,000 cases. And the criteria that we generally accept as being useful or sensible for entry into an ECMO CPR program are generally the younger patients that don't have pre existing comorbidities that we know about, witness arrests, uh, CPR within 10 minutes, and shockable rhythm, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Now, that automatically excludes about 90% of patients. If you then look at those patients that get return of circulation, around 90% of those patients will get it within about 21 minutes. So a useful definition of refractory cardiac arrest is, is a cardiac arrest duration of, of um, around 20 minutes. So we're really only looking at around about 4% of the total cardiac arrest population as potential eCPR candidates. Uh, why is the presenting rhythm important? Well, it does matter very much what your presenting rhythm is in terms of your prognosis. If you've got an initial shockable rhythm, again, this is another study from Canada looking at uh, over 1,600 out-of-hospital cardiac arrests. If you present with an initial shockable rhythm versus a non-shockable rhythm, your chances of, of survival will become less than about 1% by about uh, 48 minutes. If you present with a non-shockable rhythm, such as asystole, your chance of survival becomes less than 1% after only 15 minutes. So they're very different prognostic groups. And that's why eCPR in the outpatient setting or out-of-hospital out of setting is generally uh, constrained to um, initial shockable rhythms. So the other thing you have to do, and the other caveat to do this properly, you really have to get everybody on board. You have to talk to your ED, they need to understand who they need to call to come and provide the service, you need to have ICU involved, you need to have cardiology prepared to do uh, PCR procedures on arrested patients or on patients on ECMO support, you need cardiothoracic surgery involvement, anaesthesia perfusion, and the administration obviously needs to be supported as, as well. The other thing you need to do is collaborate with your ambulance service because you're going to have to ask them to change their protocols. Normally, they, uh, for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, the ACLS protocol is the ambulance stays for 20 minutes at the scene, goes through the whole ACLS protocol, and they only transfer patients if they've got refractory, um, a shockable rhythm. So you've got to get them to change the protocols to, to accommodate an eCPR service, to reduce the time it takes to get onto eCPR. And the other thing you need to do is introduce mechanical CPR, and this is for two reasons. Firstly, uh, these devices, this is the autopulse on the left and the Lucas device on the right, they make the provision of ECMO CPR support, the cannulation process, much simpler. It, it just de-stresses the whole situation. But the other major advantage they have is that they mean that patients can be transported safely to hospital from the scene while they're getting effective CPR. Now, it may surprise you to know that uh, in New South Wales, ambulance officers are not supposed to give uh, CPR in the back of a moving ambulance because of RHS safety reasons. It's not safe, they can't be restrained properly, and they generally wind up sitting beside the patient just giving them a bit of a pat on the chest because of that. So this does allow you to move patients around very effectively both in hospital and out of hospital while they're getting effective CPR. The other thing you need to do, and Sean Scott from uh, St Vincent's Hospital has been a master at this, is set up simulation training so that different teams of people that don't normally work together can understand what their roles are in these uh, difficult um, arrest situations. And here we have one of our cardiothoracic surgical trainees at Prince Albert Hospital going through an eCPR simulation in our emergency department uh, with, with a mannequin on, on a Lucas device. All of this has been directed by Sean Scott. 
and, and yet another example of the ongoing collaboration between St. Vincent's Hospital and RPA. That was a joke. Um, so if, uh, if you get all of this right, all the pieces line up, all the ducks line up, you get a, have a patient like, but this is one of our early two-chair patients, this was a woman in her early 60s who had an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, was successfully resuscitated by the ambulance service, brought into our ED, re-arrested at any ED, was massaged up to the cath lab on a Lucas device, had a simultaneous uh, PCR procedure and ECMO cannulation, then blocked a, a, an occluded RCA. She spent about um, less than two days on ECMO support and was actually discharged from hospital about nine days later. So that's really the best case scenario. So does this work? Do we offer a survival benefit in these patients? Well, there is some data that we do provide a, a survival benefit in this highly selected group of patients. This, the study was a, at a university, out of um, Taiwan National University. It was 59 patients who received ECMO CPR support in an in-hospital setting, and the propensity matched to other conventionally managed patients. And what they basically found was that it was overall about a 17% absolute improvement in, in survival between the two groups. So it does appear to, to provide up to around 30% uh, survival in the in-hospital in setting. Since that study in 2008, there's been a whole bunch of case series over the past five years or so. And um, what these have basically found is that the, the cluster, the, the real sweet spot is, is around about one hour from time to rest to time to establish ECMO support. And if you can do that, you can provide survival rates of around 35, 40, up to 54% from the Melbourne CHAIR trial that was done about two years ago. Beyond the one hour mark, your survival drops off fairly dramatically. And I think one of the most useful studies from the series is the one by Le Guin at 120 minutes. This is a, a study from Paris using very good protocol, mechanical CPR. They, they enrolled 50 patients and only had two survivors. So a very tough study to do, but very, very useful information because it suggests that there really is a hard limit to how long we can sustain these patients for, unless they've got some other uh, an indication to keep going, either signs of life or, or some other reason for, for you to keep going. Now these sort of numbers really could occur pretty well with our own experience in Sydney. Um, Mark Dennis from Prince Alfred Hospital and Peter McCaddy from St Vincent's Hospital looked at our five-year retrospective experience with in-hospital and out-of-hospital uh, cardiac arrest with ECMO support. We had 37 patients. Um, two-thirds uh, inpatients, one-third uh, out-of-hospital cardiac arrest, generally fairly young, more than half of them were VT, VF presentations, a few PEAs, and um, only 8% presented in asystole. We managed to get um, these patients on within about an hour. Um, as median cardiac arrest duration was 53 minutes. Duration of ECMO support is actually fairly short. These patients either tend to survive or they tend to die um, as a fairly binary response, and so they don't get prolonged ECMO support. We make a decision fairly early as to whether we're going to withdraw or not. And of these 37 patients, we had 13 survivors, which was around 35%. But most gratifyingly, all of these patients were neurologically intact. They all had CPCs, um, cerebral performance scores of one or two. So we had no vegetative uh, survivors in this group, and that's our initial experience. Where are things heading in the sphere? Well, there are a number of centres, in particular Paris, but also London and Prague, that are looking at uh, out-of-hospital ECMO CPR support to try to minimise the amount of time it takes to get patients onto ECMO. This is a photo that's kind of gone viral in the ECMO community. This is a, a, an actual case that was like, being cannulated by a French uh, an anesthesiologist called Lionel Lameau uh, on the floor of the Louvre uh, earlier last year. This patient unfortunately did not survive. Um, this is another patient that's been cannulated uh, in an apartment building in Paris and is being lifted out of the apartment window because they couldn't get the patient down the lift on the stretcher and on the ECMO pump. And as it happened, this apartment actually had quite a nice view of the Arc de Triomphe because that was how they got them out of that building. So, so European centres in particular are really embracing this and trying to push the, the barriers in terms of reducing the amount of time it takes to get patients onto ECMO support. And recently these, these authors published their, their uh, preliminary experience on the use of out-of-hospital ECMO support for refractory cardiac arrest. 
The entry criteria were patients that had arrested for more than 20 minutes, so they made the decision at 20 minutes, whereas we would actually make the decision earlier, so that they could actually maybe save a bit of time if they changed that uh, criteria. But it was for witness arrest, early CPR, an end tidal CO2 of more than 10 millimetres of mercury or signs of life. If they thought that they were going to take more than 10 minutes to transport them to hospital, they were cannulated on the scene, uh, which was about half the 18 patients. And the overall um, time to establish ECMO in this outer hospital cohort was 71 minutes. So it's a fairly, fairly long period of time to get these patients onto ECMO, but uh, fairly respectable survival in that um, just under 30% of these patients survived with good neurological outcomes. And what they noted in this trial was that the best predictor of survival was signs of life uh, at the time of the decision to perform ECMO CPR. So I think we need to refine our, our um, indications further to accommodate some of these newer findings. So to summarise then, ECMO CPR really is not for everybody. Um, the media love it, it uh, plays very well. Uh, to the public's imagination, but it really is only for a minority of highly selected uh, cardiac arrest cases, which I think we need to reassure the Department of Health about uh, in this state as, as we start to roll it out more broadly. Um, the key determinants of survival are early effective CPR and the time taken to establish ECMO, and preferably this should be within one hour if possible. It's also fair to say that good quality survival is possible in about a third of patients if you can achieve those goals, although there is a lot of morbidity associated with this, this uh, support, the survival uh, outcomes are actually quite good. We still need to do some more work on refining our indications for ECMO support and the cost and resource uh, implications of this, of this uh, support, if it's more widely adopted, have yet to be determined. Thank you.